Okay, welcome everybody and welcome Dr. Marie Skillen. Over to you, Marie. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the final session this evening for the short course in professional uh, learning that Western Sydney has been offering. The focus that I'll be giving this evening is differentiation, and I'm looking at considering it as a way of thinking about teaching and learning, and in particular for the community languages classroom that each of you is representing. Before we start, I'd like to do an acknowledgement of country with respect for Aboriginal cultural protocol and out of recognition that its campuses occupy their traditional lands. Western Sydney University acknowledges the Darug, Eora, Darawal and Wiradjuri peoples and thanks them for their support of its work in their lands in the greater Western Sydney and beyond. For those of you that are on one of those lands, welcome to any people of Aboriginal descent Thank you for joining us this evening and your involvement uh, as well as everybody else tonight. The overview for this evening, and as I've already said, the focus is on differentiation. What does it mean for our teaching practice? Examples of approaches that we can use with learners of all ages, so regardless of being early childhood, primary, secondary or older, the, that how do we actually look at engaging them and catering for their differences and their abilities. We also need to cater for the syllabuses and the different languages that each of you are representing and focusing on in your particular teaching area. So far, you've had a variety of sessions presented to you over a number of weeks and you've been thinking about and possibly challenged about your classroom, your learners and your role as a teacher. You will have probably been exposed to different ideas, different approaches, different strategies and be considering how do you use those with your teaching, your learners, your classrooms. So some of the key questions that I think come from that and would be part of your reflections are who are we teaching? What are the strengths and limitations? And those strengths and limitations and not only for the students that we each work with, but also us as teachers. And what are some of the key questions that we need to consider as we prepare and plan and design for our classroom teaching and then reflect on afterwards? Now, thank you very much to everybody that has done the pre-activity, my three minutes, three questions. I was very, very impressed by the number of responses that I did receive and using the QR code or possibly the web link, you have been able to access a free app um, called Mentimeter. I'm not sure how many of you may have actually used that particular interface or app previously, but if you do only use three questions per poll or per activity, then it will be free for you. And I think it's quite a good um, tool to put in your toolbox, to use, to think about, to consider or store up as something a little bit different if you are going to be working with students and have access to mobile devices or maybe um, set computers or laptops as well. So what were the results like? Here you'll see a snapshot and this was taken a couple of days ago and I know that a few more of you have actually participated. So the numbers are a little bit different now as are the locations. But I found it very interesting to see where each of you represents on the globe for the language or the teaching space, the cultures that you are representing. And as you'll see, we've got quite a, a domination here in, in the middle. Um, we have a number of people that are out in the smaller islands as well. And if we start to actually match up where some of those places are in the Pacific Ocean, um, we may have, and I'm, I am guessing a little bit because the dots are a little bit bigger than places on the map, but we have the Solomon Islands, we've got New Zealand. I think I have people that are representing Japan, Vietnam, Taiwan. Uh, we've got Italy, Germany, Poland, and the list goes on and on. So uh, thank you very much for participating. We've all got similar but different impressions as well about what we might be involved with 
and how we would actually deliver our language and engage our students. When I asked you the second question to consider what differentiation is, as you can see, there are many, many responses on the screen. When you start to, to burrow down and to have a little bit more of a look, there are lots of common words coming out there. And whilst we can see difference, different separation as being some of the larger words described, they are also in different forms in some of the smaller words that are also appearing on the screen. So in summing up your, your definition, your thoughts, your reflections, your um, participation in this particular terminology, what are we looking at? We're looking at variation. We're looking at difference, adjusting content, variety, catering for different needs. Diversity was a key word as well that is coming out and inclusiveness. Tailoring to needs, flexibility, grouping, process and strategies. And they're just some of the words that are probably the key ones that would summate what has actually been shared in this particular screen. So why is differentiation important? I think all of us, yourselves, myself, we, we recognise that our classrooms are mixed stability and learners. We also recognise that teaching everyone one way is going to possibly alienate or disengage some. And from the suggestions in terms of strategies and what you see differentiation to be, I think that that was coming out very um, loud and clear from what people were sharing here. What we're doing when we differentiate as well, we're, we're showing awareness, we're considering the needs and the interests of the students and how we can actually alleviate any discipline issues. So things like our classroom management issues, but involve our students, engage them actively and get them to achieve either at a higher level or commensurate with their abilities. So what to differentiate? That's one of our bigger questions that we need to consider. And the way that I would break this up is in this frame. The first one will be looking at and considering the classroom elements. And those classroom elements, there are four parts. The first part is content. We then look at our process, the how, the doing. We've got our third part, which is product. So what is the actual output? And fourthly, we're considering what the learning environment would be. What is our classroom? How do all of those things come together as elements or individual components to make a successful experience for both the students and yourself as the classroom teacher? The second part of breaking this up is looking at the student characteristics. And again, when I was reading through some of the suggestions about what people were doing in terms of strategies and approaches for their responses to um, the, the pre-activity, you were looking at the interests of students. By knowing the interests, the individuality of what a student is, then you can actually work with them and engage them and hopefully get them working and making connections with your particular subject area. Considering their readiness, where are they in the spectrum of their learning and what needs to be done to progress them? And the third part would be looking at the learning profile. So knowing your students. So together, the classroom elements, the student characteristics and those seven components are very, very important for constructing your differentiated experience and what you would be doing in your classroom. If we were actually to take this a little bit further, and these diagrams and different things will be shared with you after this evening, but if we start to expand what those classroom elements in particular are looking like, in terms of the content, we're looking at how the content can be differentiated. How can it be separated? How can it be made into different components to support the readiness, the interests and the learning profile? So that is the student characteristics and link with those. In terms of the process, we're looking again at how do we break that up and connect it from classroom element down into the student characteristics 
And as you'll see, both the product and the learning environment as well, how they connect into readiness, interests and learning profile. In terms of summing up what differentiation is, and many of you probably are aware of this, what we're looking at is that it can be patterns, okay? This, I think this, um, and student focused, a way of thinking of teaching and learning, looking at the core, the heart of what you were doing, looking and considering the strategies and approaches like flexible grouping that you might employ. So they're things that we probably do every day but don't necessarily always label or think about we are actually differentiating. If we compare what differentiation is not, then we're looking at these things, okay? Differentiation is not looking only to focus at one end of the spectrum, thinking about breaking up just abilities, um, dumbing down or extending the curriculum or the opportunities or making students do more. Because when we start to make students do more, they get a little bit um, unhappy, I guess you could say, and they don't enjoy the learning and their involvement that well, and therefore they don't perform. At this particular stage, I'd just like to ask, because I can't see all the questions, if there's any questions, but does anyone have any questions anything that they might like to um, ask verbally or maybe has been shared in the chat? I, um, I'm keeping an eye on the chat. Um, I suppose we, uh, we need to just uh, perhaps emphasize, um, everybody, please make sure that if you do have any questions, go ahead, put them in the chat and uh, I'll be looking out for your, for your questions, okay? Try not to use your microphones because we've got uh, over 120 people this evening. So just put it in the chat um, and, uh, and, uh, and we'll go ahead with that. Because in, um, Marie, of course, a differentiation is something which is vital for a lot of our um, community language schools because um, a lot of our kids are in one classroom and they're different stages, different abilities, different uh, levels. So it's something that we're all uh, aware of. Um, so yeah, please, yeah. if you do have any questions, go ahead, please, in the chat. Okay, all right, thank you. Well, if there are no questions at the minute, what we'll start to look at is some different strategies. And... These can be many and varied. Um, some of the strategies that were shared in the pre-activity, and I was very impressed by the different types of things people were um, willing to do, um, because some teachers don't always like to go out of their comfort zone. I think that in recognising your role as a community language teacher, you have different dimensions, different components that you need to do and to get students to be successful in, whether it be reading, whether it be writing, speaking or listening. And so you have many challenges and the variety of things that you would do and approaches that you would employ um, are tapping into all of the different learning styles and the different senses as well. So... There were a number of people that were using books, using pictures as stimulus, um, poems. Games seemed to be quite a popular um, form of engaging students and communicating and I guess using as a hook or stimulus to start a conversation to then lead it into the different aspects that you were teaching. Technology was there as well. And I think you can see on the screen there, somebody has mentioned about using class dojos. Um, you've probably used things like Kahoot, which is very much like a challenge and a game. Um, there would be other forms of interfaces and technology and tools that you probably are also employing. Um, you would use a number of apps, I'm sure, and recording devices because languages has changed a lot. For me and for some of you, you can probably connect to when I learned languages and when I studied um, in particular German for a number of years, we had to use the old tape deck um, and uh, that was quite different that now we can actually use a mobile phone and an app there to actually record and translate things uh, if we need by. One of the other aspects that I thought was really interesting coming out of some of the strategies that are used by various teachers that are involved here uh, this evening 
is that you were looking to build relationships with your students. You were looking to know your students and finding out the background and their interests, which links into the previous diagram of the student um, characteristics and having the look profile because that can assist you and support you when you're starting to do different themes uh, within your syllabus and language area and building the idea of cult and knowledge. One of the greatest things that I actually saw and I think was coming through as well from what was shared was a sense of fun and helping uh, students so that they were passionate or interested and challenged about what you were sharing with them, even though sometimes it may not be easy um, and other times it might be uh, too easy. And so finding the right part on the spectrum as to where they'd be. But the fun element was there along with what I would see as a serious uh, knowledge and building understanding and fluency within the language that you're working with. When we start to sort of summarise more so about the differentiation strategies, and here again, I'm not sure which ones people may be aware of. Uh, they're quite often uh, things that we absorb, like for example, key vo vocabulary. I would say that vocabulary is very, very important in the role of a language teacher um, and trying to do the translations. Um, I'm not going to try to quote the different ways the verbs and different things would be, it's not my strength, but knowing and having a good vocabulary is very, very important. The idea of curriculum compacting, and that's something that I want to talk a little bit more about uh, shortly and to provide an example that may be useful to people in considering something a little bit different. Looking at the individual learning goals and the needs and developing those um, goals and needs and uh, understanding with students is also really important and dependent on the strategies we might actually use. Some of you may use a technique like a learning centre and through learning centres or maybe stations, you can actually facilitate or guide independent or collaborative opportunities for your learning. You've demonstrated that you are using stimulus materials and a variety of those things from, from the books, from the videos, whatever it might be that you're employing and that you are open to different ways of forming your student groups, the flexibility and adapting your instruction to support the learners and the needs and the variety of the ages or the groupings within the, the students and the classes that you're working with. There are opportunities, and I think you would recognise that by doing and using some of these um, strategies, that they will provide an opportunity that encourages active involvement and richer, deeper learning by students. Um, some of the ones here are to do with tiered and leveled activities, challenging students, giving them different opportunities, open-ended questions, and allowing student choice. I think your area of the language um, languages is very good for theme-based or pro, pro, project-based work as well. And that you can have a dialogue and an interaction with the students that is broader in many ways and encourages the depth of their learning or the skills that they have in terms of reading or writing, listening or, um, or verbalizing the language that you're working with. Um, here, I'm just sort of saying that you've got different considerations. It's an expansion of that. Um, and you can demonstrate it in different ways. What I think here is that we've got five dimensions of differentiation. However, what I would like to do is describe it as more as integrating differentiation into your teaching practice. And by that, what I'm looking at is firstly the content, the curriculum and what you are teaching. And here you've got multiple components about how you teach and deliver and develop the skills and the understanding within your learners. If we look at the instructional processes, 
what we're doing there is thinking about the process, about how it is being taught, the way that you will engage people. We've then got the product, and that's a tangible result about what you can see in terms of the interests and the abilities, and hopefully the progress of the students that you actually are working with and their interactions and their strength in one or more components of learning a particular language that you are working with. In terms of the teacher, that's you. You have developed different ways to be flexible. There is creativity, diversity, and learning styles that you have your strengths, but also your openness to bring into what that classroom experience will be. And you all have passion and a strong interest in what you are actually teaching as well. And that will help with the decisions and the choices and the ability of what you will actually do. Now, what I wanted to, to start to, to move across and to get your involvement with is to think about different models. One type of model can be concept maps, which is very visual and very interactive. Um, it's a way of summating brainstorming. There is also the idea of flexible grouping options, and then that leads into our flow of instruction as well. But as we start to think about how we might differentiate our instruction, the learning opportunities and the learning experience, we often get challenged. And there are a number of roadblocks that we might come up to. And what I'd like you to, in a moment, go into some breakout rooms for probably about five or six minutes and to talk in small groups is to consider what are some of the roadblocks, what are some of the challenges or obstacles that may keep you from differentiating in your particular experience, okay? So that's one thing I'd like you to consider when you speak in, in a breakout room shortly with one another. And the other one is, how do you actually build your learner profile? How do you start to understand your students? In which ways do you collect information about students, about their learning, about their achievement levels, their ability? How do you do that? So two, two things that I'd like you to think about and discuss in a moment in small groups. What are the obstacles, challenges or roadblocks that you might experience in your particular situation of teaching? And what are the ways that you create or build your learner um, profile? Any questions, anything somebody might like to um, check at the moment? Uh, there's there was there were some questions just before. Um, now I'll go back to yeah. if I could. Um, so Snezana was asking. Sorry, Alex. Sorry. You're on sorry. Here. Yep, I just disappeared. Snezana was saying if differentiation can be applied in assessment tasks, if you've got the um, kids in the same group, students in the same group with different abilities. Yes. Yes. Assessment tasks, I think that you can do that. And some of the choice that we would actually allow, we can consider um, competency-based assessment that we can look at. Um, it depends if we're in high stakes situations, because if we are in high stakes situations, we've got to think very carefully about how we build the knowledge and the understanding and prepare them, unfortunately, for the external exams. But I think in earlier grades that using competency based and allowing opportunities for people to build their knowledge and their confidence um, can be very positive and good as well. Okay, that's that's pretty much it there. Mm -hmm. Okay, well. We're going to go out to a breakout room for about five or six minutes, as I said. Um, we will, you need to consider in those small groups, what are the roadblocks, the challenges or the obstacles that might keep you 
um, from differentiating or might um, block your ability to have good flow at differentiating the learning experience? And how do you get to know your learner profile? What are the things that you do to gather information about students and uh, their abilities? So just I can go to ahead see and if I've got. I can do that yep, if you please, like. Alec. Yep, sure. So we're yes, looking at how, how big would you like them to be? These, uh, how small? How many? Five? Probably, probably groups of five. Yep. Okay, let's do. I think that's probably it. Okay, here we go. All right, so we're just creating these now. And yes, they're joining. Excellent, excellent. Don't be shy, people. <laughs> please join. If you've got any questions, please put them in the um, in the uh, in the chat. Um, I could just say that some of you did did ask questions, but they were addressed actually during during um, some of these slides. So, so if there's anything else, just put it in the slide. In the chat, that is. may have discussed or individually you might like to share. I'm happy for if anyone like to, to verbalize it or put it in the chat. Who'd like to share something? I can see a few new faces on the screen. Hello. Can I say something? Yes, yes. Uh, I came from the room 11. Uh, I teach okay, Farsi. Okay, thanks. Is it my Nasrin? Nasrin, yes. My language is um, yep. Persian. I teach Farsi. I have a prob problem with some students born here and um, they don't understand the modern language. And I teach them from Zoom. My problem from Zoom, not mm -hmm. class, because I have enough experience for teaching for a long time, but um, from Zoom is not enough for them because they don't understand the Farsi because the mother and father family doesn't uh, talk Farsi and they can't find. I try to learn them, but uh, my problem is uh, from zooming here is uh, I couldn't find the book uh, translated from Farsi to English, um, give them in here. Right, okay. Thank you for sharing that, Nazrin, because I think 
it's quite difficult to find examples of books that can be shared in that online environment as opposed to actually if you had hard copies that you could share in person in a classroom. Um, I know fellow colleagues are struggling that with with teaching English and literacy to, to teacher education students. Yes, I, um, I try to use them from internet, from YouTube, from uh, every place for translate for them and show them from power um, powerball and different way. I try to do is good at the moment, but there are many challenge on that. Mm. Is, is there the possibility that you could, if you teach them enough language um, and vocabulary, that they could create some of their own, like small books and using technology as well, or cartoon strips or something like that, that could maybe be applied and, and link and uh, start to engage them? Yes, just um, an idea. some of the, our uh, teacher did for this. Yes, thank you. Thank you very much. Yep, that's okay. Would anyone else like to share? Maybe put something in the chat or. Yeah, can I, can I uh, quickly something? Uh, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, my name is Palu. So I teach at the Malayalam. Wow. And uh, I just started with the Hindi. But what I've seen is um, uh, the extent of differentiation. So when I say the extent is, uh, uh, if you have a w w wide gap uh, in the ability of the learners um, and the systemic issues, um, uh, which uh, is within the public school system, uh, where every student who is not to the level, they just keep uh, pushing them to the next level. The next level means the one, even if they are not mm. uh, uh, ready for year two, they get pushed to year two, year three, year four. And, um, you know, for example, I'm just, just giving an example. Year five, they may not still know the uh, multiplication tables, you know, uh, or, you know, so things like that. So uh, so the, the teachers um, have to uh, really work on a very wide uh, um, ability level where uh, there is, a lot of time will be spent on uh, devising that approach, uh, whether it is from a pedagogy or whether it is from a curriculum or even, I mean, assessment, forget about assessment. It's, it's very hard to um, uh, get to that, that uh, because if you have so many different ability level students in one class. So that is the systemic issues is the roadblocks that I see uh all uh in 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 this um uh in this uh i mean differentiation is a great thing to do but how what is the extent to which that you should differentiate that is a question back to you you know okay thank you some really good um points actually made yeah. there um Bhattu, and thank you for sharing i think we are unfortunately um constrained with um our system our our teaching system and there is, regardless of whether we think somebody should be held back or not, unfortunately, they are always moved on from one grade to the next. Um, it's not unless there are some school situations and it's quite unique here in Australia that there may be um, learning situations where students are graded or allowed to progress. And I can think of one example that I've had contact with years ago um, that they focus on the content and allowing the students to progress at their own rate, um, which was far more positive than just moving and being moved um, online. It, uh, it does, any sort of class that we deal with is mixed ability, as far as I'm concerned. Um, I think we're dealing with many, many different abilities um, and strengths and weaknesses at various times by individual students. And so that is a challenge for the teacher. And it is like coming up with different approaches or strategies that maybe we can use that does take us each very individually time to create, but hopefully we can reap the rewards a little bit later for some of those things, um, you know, start to, to modify them from the, the ages. I think you working with young children at the kindergarten level and anyone else in tonight's session that is there. I absolutely take my hat off to you. I think it is an absolute challenge to work with four and five-year-old children. Um, 
And for me, with more of a secondary background, but when I was teaching K to six, um, it was very, very different. So uh, we do have lots of challenges. I guess I can't answer them all at the moment um, because I am aware that some people would like some examples, some more hard and fast examples this afternoon um, that maybe might be able to support or give you some ideas to think about. So, uh, and thank you to those that are sharing in the chat as well. I'm sort of scanning those. Um, yes, I think um, the comment forced by parents and um, those wanting to learn it in the class, that is an absolute challenge that you have in an area that is maybe extending children in their cultural background and um, understanding of a, a, a language that their family uh, may work with or that they are being asked or told to take it in a more formalised school situation um, as an elective subject and extending that through. Um, some really good sharing. Thank you very much for that um, here in terms of what people have verbalised but also are putting into the chat session. Um, I am going to move on because I do want to share a couple of strategies because I know that that's one of the things that people would like. Um, so I'm going to just sort of move on um, here. This, one of the other questions I asked you was about how you collect data from students. And this is a technique that I found not too bad. It can be used and adapted for younger learners to slightly older. I think the majority of people maybe here tonight are part of the primary uh, teaching uh, but there may be um, some, some colleagues that are dealing with secondary roles tickets or something as simple as um, a sticky note or if you have an online equivalent because some of the learning at the moment and I imagine many of your challenge last year with COVID and the move into or immediate move into an online situation that many of us including myself were not necessarily prepared or maybe had the skills for but you can do pre-assessments or checks by using four questions I tend to choose three like you have seen and um, do it in different ways. But this one's quite a good technique to actually use and to ask them for their involvement or to write something down. The sticky note assessment, it can collect data quite quickly and you can target what you see or want the questions to actually be, okay? Um, you can use that to do your groups and I'm going to leave that because I think you, you know, because this is a situation that we're all doing. Um, we're being asked, and somebody has asked about assessment as well and what we can actually do. We can set the same thing. And in this case, for a fair selection, everybody has to take the same exam. Please climb that tree. And when we look, there's probably only one animal sitting out there on the, on the ground that can actually solve and execute that particular assessment. So what do we do and how do we apply that as teachers? So some of the strategies that you may or may not be familiar with, um, a couple of the ones that I've selected tonight are here for you, the what and how to differentiate. In terms of diagrams, you can do brainstorming, do concept maps. The tiered instruction, and I think some people are actually using that and setting levels of achievement that you can start at an entry level, a beginner's, a foundation, and start to move up for people. One of the ones that I want to talk a little bit more about will be compacting um, and choice boards. So compacting and choice boards are linked. There is the idea of cubing and how you might set that up and uh, some other, uh, the, the intelligence preferences. Menus becomes a quite interesting one that has a very foodie approach, um, but you can also do it culturally and uh, consider other levels or ways that you might decide to combine menus with something like a tiered instruction. This here, I'm not sure if people are aware of it, but I wanted to share this particular link because there are many, many different resources that are available to everyone. Okay, it's not behind the closed doors of the New South Wales uh, Department of Education, although many of you probably have access to different resources. This link, and it will be on the reference and resource list, gives you different ideas um, of think, pair, share, the question formulations, different thinking skill exercises, 
They're just a couple, but there are many other activities that you might find applicable to what you can use and do with your students. Um, in moving on to the ideas, this one here is a Freya diagram, or sometimes it's actually called a think board, okay? Um, what I had been going to do, but I'm, I'm sort of mindful that our time is limited. And I think that if you would like to ask questions here in this main forum, that it may be of more value for, for everyone. But in this particular diagram, and if you do type in the word Freya diagram or think board, you can get free templates, okay, that will generate out a, a, a frame for you, a template for you, and you can add or delete or change as you see fit. In terms of this particular one, you would put your keyword, and I could have asked each of you tonight to select your language and then to put that there as a central theme and then to define it, to give me some facts, some characteristics, some ideas about the culture, what you teach, your syllabus, the concepts, et cetera. The examples can be very specific. So for example, if um, I use the, the, the language or, or what we're focusing in talking to Nazarene before, um, Persia and Persian language, um, we would give some examples like that. But my non-examples might be putting Japanese scripting or Chinese words, or um, maybe the, it's, it's Russian or Cambodian or Khmer, sorry. Um, different other things would go in there. This is actually quite a good technique for anybody that wishes to do a pre-assessment of students and to see or to know their understanding of the culture, the language, or what you have been teaching, um, how to write things, the connection between the students. And if it's for younger learners, they may draw things more so, if that's how you have taught them, or they may more move more into the writing, the characters, um, and express themselves differently. You can also use this as a post assessment so that people can look at it and add things in a different color or different way, okay? And um, if they use a different color pen or pencil, it shows the before and the after, okay? Um, so that is quite a useful tool to either gather information informally or more formally uh, with the students that you might be working with, okay? So that's one idea. It can be used in any sort of subject area as well. The other one is think about open-ended questions. And you're probably using those quite It might be the way that you need to engage or to hook students to learn something and to then teach them either about the culture or that you want them to read or to write, to listen um, or to speak, okay? So that with open-ended questions, they are going to be eliciting more responses from your learners, not just the closed ones, you might go through your vocabulary and that will be your closed question. You will give, um, I'm just trying to think of when I was trying to teach myself French a couple of years ago before I was traveling and uh, I used an app and they were, a lot of those were in that particular app, um, closed questions, which meant it was a little bit harder when I then had to put things together in a more open situation, okay? but. Here I've put in some suggestions about what it is, some examples you could consider, why it might work. This can also be targeted to be independent or collaborative work opportunities as well with your students. Um, student voice, I think one that can work well and is good for differentiating and can assist you with the different types of learners and abilities that you have. The only thing is, as a teacher, it will take you more time to set up. And the ideas are linked to the concept of menu, so tiered or leveled learning, the concept of choice boards, which I think is quite a good one and appropriate and links to compaction for students in this particular syllabus or content area that each of you represent. You can do your exit passes, workshops and things also. In terms of a choice board, are people familiar with choice boards? Have you heard about those? Not sure. Okay. 
Well, for um, the foreign languages or, or community language, what you can do here, and as you um, would see, uh, there are many tools, and there are many tools to available to us now um, as teachers. So no, okay. Um, so what it is, it's usually a grid, a three by three grid, all right, which is represented on the right hand side of the screen. And what you can do is use options. And this is one way that I'd also suggest that you can do compaction. When I've used it with um, mixed ability groups within schools, um, what I have done is I've also coded the squares in colours. And the coding has been a system that I would say everybody in the class must do one of the yellow boxes. So if one of the options that I had here was yellow, everyone must do a yellow, a blue and a pink box. And what that, that is doing is grading students maybe from a simple entry type of task to something a little bit harder and something definitely more challenging or harder. What it allows by the very careful colouring of boxes or numbering or labelling of each opportunity within there, because they're random, the way you actually can structure the tasks in the choice board, a student doesn't realise that they may be operating at a lower level because they're more of an emerging learner in the space and the concepts um, that they are developing, but they still feel that they are achieving and they're achieving commensurate with their ability. They also have the goal to start to move towards other things because they may see something of interest to them. And it could be that they need to develop a, a small role play, um, a script for it. They might need to produce um, a, a video recording or an audio recording using some piece of um, technology tool that you're suggesting, but it gives them the element of choice. The other one as well, the way you can use a choice board is you can allocate points. And depending how you allocate the points, is that you might say that everybody by the end of one week or two weeks needs to have attained 10 or 20 points or 100 points. And so the way they mix and match the learning opportunities is entirely up to them. The order in which they do the task is actually entirely up to the students as well. Some tasks in your choice board can be uh, individual. They can also be collaborative to engage with children. This one here, I've sort of just given a little bit more information for you and, and looked more purposely at the idea of um, a language classroom, okay? That there can be the nitty gritty nuts and bolts. Maybe it's vocabulary or something that you're wanting them to do to learn about um, and to do before they get started, a foundation level. You can do things about culture. Maybe they have to go and to find, do a web search and find a particular item or photo or something and write about it, okay? The listening, they can listen to something that you have given them in terms of reading. Maybe they need to speak back and record and then upload that to a space as well. So different elements, different choice that you can do. And the way that we would use those particular um, icons and items would be set up like this. So the same sort of three three by three grid, but you've allocated an icon and that's your coding as to what you would want students to do for a particular topic. Any questions, any thoughts at the moment? Um, Snazana, um, the, the activity online, uh, what I'll do is I'll look to add some additional resources and send those through to Alex for sharing with you in the next couple of days. Okay, along with um, some other notes and, and the presentation. Okay. Um, and I think asthma, the exit pass, I can find a little bit more information and include that too with my notes, um, add to those for you and anything else anyone would have. Um, uh, I'm just looking Balu. Yes, I agree. If you're a casual one day, one situation, not, not good to plan in advance. It's very, very hard. Um, you almost need to have activity cards or, or something like that that you can 
that you spend a little bit of time, unfortunately, it's always time that we have to create things, but you can bring out um, to use with the students. How many of um, yes, it can be in answer to the question about whether you can use a choice board for homework for students. You could say that they need to select one item or complete other things for homework. That would be absolutely fine. How you use your choice board is entirely up to you. But as I said, the way I have found it um, when I have had a lot of lower ability classes that I have taught, I've tried to extend them and to see what I knew about my students. So they colouring the boxes meant that they didn't think they were doing something extra or the more able students didn't think they had more work to do than somebody else, okay? So it's a very subtle way that you can um, do things. Uh, as I said, you can create the choice board. It can be bigger, but the three by three is probably the best way to do it. And um, you can work with uh, adapting things, okay, as you go. If I just look, a couple of other ones. This one here, this comes into compaction and it's another form or extension of how you can use that choice board. So you name something, you prove it and you change it. And there's some guiding questions down here that can help you once again in a tabulated grid type of form as uh, how you might set your learning, okay? Um, it can be adapted for the group, the, the opportunities, the grades uh, that you are particularly working with. Um, this one here is a little bit more on group instruction, which I think most of you would probably be aware of. Um, so I'll leave that that you can catch up. But this one here, the differentiating the levels, this is a nice summary way that you can look to consider the levels of the students that you're working with. And this can be changed into something like a choice board if you wish. You can adapt your labeling. You can consider as part of your planning, your design, what your expectations are, your instructions, how you will assign the assignments or the tasks, the activities, and what the assessments might be. And both the assignments or the activities or the tasks, as well as the assessments can include choice. And this goes back to somebody's earlier question about how can we and or should we or could we uh, differentiate assessments? I think you can, and particularly when it's not the high stakes um, external examinations that we might be preparing students for, we can get students to work and to achieve and move from level to level and they may be a little bit different in terms of the components, whether it's reading, writing, uh, speaking or listening, but you can develop them and hopefully eventually get them to a satisfactory whole of achievement. Okay. Um, all right. I think I've just skipped over one thing, but really some of the, um, just some of the key ideas that you would already be aware of. And I think, you know, tonight it's, it is quite a short session when you start to think about one hour, but understanding differentiation. I think most people here in this session and what's been shared prior to, to uh, coming online tonight is you do, you are very aware of differentiation, very aware of challenges, the obstacle, the roadblocks, and some of them unfortunately are out of our control that we have to, to sort of work with but to navigate a way how we can get around it. Knowing your learner and your, your classroom, I think again, I'm getting a sense that people do know that and that you definitely would all know your content and your syllabus and the different components. Where we're challenged really for any particular teaching area is our learning experience, the tools, the strategies and approaches and how we actually engage our students because we want them to have a great experience. We want them to understand we want them to develop passion um, for what we um, are sharing with them as well. But sometimes that links back, unfortunately, to those particular roadblocks. If we have a look, that's just uh, the summary. Um, but I just want to ask if any sort of discussion, any other questions that people might like to, to ask at the, at the moment. Hi, Marie, if I could ask a question, please. 
Yes, Yemen, is it? Yes, that's correct. Um, yeah. I just, in my experience with the choice boards, because I know, for example, my daughter gets choice boards for homework at school. Um, yeah. What happens is it allows students to tend to ignore certain types of questions and choose this, um, the same kind of questions all the time. So, she, for example, she might avoid a writing task because she just likes that and always choose an easier option. Do you mm -hmm. find that? Um, I think when I have set them myself, mm. I've actually tracked what students do. And mm. so um, I think that that, as, as our role as a teacher, the educator, we need to not be complacent and take the easy way out of just allowing students to do exactly that thing mm. um, of um, escaping to do higher order um, tasks or as somebody mentioned in one of the, the pre-activities, using things like blooms, working through blooms from lower to higher order uh, mm. thinking skills. So I think by coding it, by mixing things up, by being very aware about how you structure the question or the statement in that choice board um, box, mm -hmm. it's very important. And by shaking things up and saying, you've done you know, um, two weeks of pink activities. Now you've got to challenge yourself and move into like the yellow zone. So mm. coding things um, I think is quite important, whether it be by an element that they this week, instead of just reading, the person needs to go out of their comfort zone and record themselves speaking and then to mm. upload. So um, unfortunately that comes back into tracking um, by the, the teacher, but it's it's achievable. So um, I think if if I definitely had your daughter, I'd be looking at how I can move her to mm. somebody else to challenge her as well. Mm. Thank you so much for that. That's okay. Any any other questions? Anything that anyone like to ask or share? Maybe from your own experience, whether um, as with your teacher hat on, parent hat, learner hat. Can I ask, Marie? Uh, yes, yes. Hi, I'm Saras. I'm teaching Tamil to uh, kindy, kindergarten age. I would yes. like to ask what, how does it make a big um, uh, difference if we differentiate the kids with their abilities and try to move them up? Um, you know, some kids have enriched abilities. Some kids are developing. Some kids are uh, not really doing in writing, but they speak really well. So, mm -hmm. so uh, differentiating them in that way might um, help us to uh, help the teachers to develop the specific skills needed needed for them. Uh, so, is that um, uh, going to make a big deal with this differentiation that we have? Um, it is. I think you you have a couple of um, challenges. One, the age of your learners um, and, and getting them focused towards the different elements or components of what I think. I think there's four main components that each of you in the language space need to do. And if, if some of the students are exhibiting a strength in something, then what they need to be um, encouraged to do is to try something else. So if they're very strong at reading or speaking, then they need to do the opposite one. And that's where your activities would need to be structured to, to support them. You have the extra challenge, and I'm not sure how large the group would be that you are working and dealing with, but how do you keep, you know, one or two or three or four um, young children, let alone a larger group, um, engage with the various activities. And the only way that I think that I could start to think about it is by doing um, some grouping opportunities. Or you might be asking the younger learners to do like something like thinking. So they think individually, they might record or do something um, of their answer, whether it's be uh, drawing or writing, uh, depending on their ability. And then they've got to start to share with other children in smaller groups and then come back to share with, with the bigger class. But I think you've got a lot more management issues is what I'd probably be seeing about how you would actually do that. You'd have to be thinking very, very clearly and very well structured in how you execute a lesson um, with, with the learners and the age group that you're dealing with. Would that be correct? 
Uh, yes, uh, you are in a way correct that we have uh, grouped them into four mm -hmm. where one set of children can do the work uh, irrespective of uh, the teachers being besides uh, yes. giving them instructions. I mean, they can work individually. We have two groups wherein uh, one group is uh, totally dependent on uh, someone to instruct them and the other group uh, with little instructions they can do their job. We have one other group wherein, however, we we have to hold them and make them right. But they are really, really good at uh, speaking and thinking on their own. Yeah, yeah. So I think you, you've got a good approach there that you've already you, you've evidently um, looked at your, your student characteristics, you've looked at your learner profiles, you're, you've got um, good awareness about um, the ability levels and hence how you've actually structured each of those groups to enable you to hopefully give tasks that each of those groups can do, but you as a teacher and if there was a supporting person uh, assisting you can rotate um, to support them because I think that it comes into effect like the group the group um, the instruction that you would need to be doing is what would be really important. Your emerging learners probably need some different activities to try to extend them and if they have some confidence um, already that you need to see how you can get them not only to be confident maybe in speaking, but how can they do, how can they move to start writing or um, reading things more fluently? And that will go back to the structure of the activities that you give them. So I think your more able learners, you could probably use some tasks like setting up a choice board um, or some other targeted activities that you're confident they can self-pace and you can check on, but I think your other emerging learners need probably to be given that ability to start to move on to what the next phase or what your outcomes that you would like to achieve would be. Uh, yeah, we have, um, uh, we have grouped the kids and we have activities in such a way, uh, but the, the kids who are speaking, who doesn't uh, do the work by themselves, we have two uh, our elder students, older students who have completed their HSC from our school, yes. uh, helping us to make these kids uh, focus on what we wanted to achieve. We wanted to make the children write on their own. Mm -hmm. um, and we have those helper students who will help us make the little ones learn to write on their own. The okay, target for that's... these kids are different and the target for the other kids are yes. different. Yes, yes, I, I can understand that. And I think it's um I think it's really good that you have um engaged other like students um that have gone through their own learning and that hopefully the these younger children that you're working with and, and slightly older ones and across the, the spectrum of ability level that they can connect to. Um, but it's probably, you probably have to, well, you have to put just as much thought into extending the ones that can do what you want them already, but particularly those ones that you want to move to the next um, level of achievement um, and through using some of the different activities that you might be able to employ. So um, I think it'd be quite an interesting one that I'm kind of aware um, that we're over time, that would be really good to, to unpack and talk about more. But I am also wondering if there are other questions anyone would um, like to ask. Uh, thank but you for the opportunity. Very, very well. You sound thank like you. you're doing well in terms of what you've employed. Oh, thank you so much for that. We have another teacher working on, on this. So we mm -hmm. both work together on this. Yeah, I think um, that collaboration and having a team approach um, and as I said, engaging students, uh, school school age students or, or those that have finished is a very good strategy and approach that, that you have um, taken up uh, to employ with this one. Mm. Thank you, Mary. That's okay. Any other questions, anything anyone like to share? May I have a question? Yes, yes, hello. Hello, uh, I'm teaching in Tibetan. Uh huh. Yes. Yeah. In my class, students learn uh, 
when on language the uh, student could not uh, control to speak English. Yeah, they try to explain not to speak English. Uh, we learned uh, Tibetan language, but they mm -hmm. could not talk. But uh, we are very typical that situation. So can you teach us the how can method to the stop the English when they uh, in class? So can you just um, just the key points so that they are, are trying to use English in class or not? Uh, no, we uh, teach a dependent language. Yes. But they, uh, they're talking to each other, uh, not Tibetan language. The Tibetan language, they so very difficult. They yes. need to talk to English. Uh, so, yeah, that's very difficult. Right, right, okay. Um, that's an interesting one um, because I know, I, I definitely don't speak Vietnamese, but when I've had to take Vietnamese lessons, those children wouldn't actually speak English for me, which was very, very difficult um, because it certainly was not my target language at all. Um, I think you were going to have to, to attempt to give some small activities like small milestones of what they could do and speak in the Tibetan language um, to try to encourage them even though the language and speaking it may be difficult, um, but they need to understand and have a sense about the why. Why are they doing this? And I know that it may be that unfortunately they might be um, like forced, like some of the people put into the chat, that they may be being forced to do it and it's not what they want to learn, these particular children. But I do think you need to get some small activities that would start to encourage them that they would have success um, and achieve in terms of um, using the language that they are supposed to be learning. Um, you don't want to discourage the children from using English um, because that has ramifications, I guess, elsewhere. But you want to sort of say that they are limited to the amount of English that they can use during the time period that maybe they are learning the language with you. Um, that once we come in, and I know that um, in the past I've had language teachers that will welcome you. Like each time we walked into the classroom, we had to speak the, the language to, you know, enter and to exit the room. Maybe some steps to starting it and then some smaller activities that you have as well. Um, that you can think of and, and to use. Um, I think you've got an interesting situation uh, and, and an obstacle there uh, for what you you are facing at the moment. Uh, I think is it Jang, Jang Chup? Yeah, uh, I do uh, small activity. Sometimes we, uh, yeah. sometime we show a photo, some, sometimes we show a movie a little bit and they yeah. will start. The, the more there's lots of students could not speak in uh, Tibetan language. Mm -hmm. That's why it's very difficult to explain. Yeah. 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 So is there, when you share things from like movies, is it possible to get them um, to, to maybe do small excerpts or even to role play or role model? Because what age students are, are you working with? Uh, get it, uh, kindergarten. Kindergarten as well, okay, all right. So they're probably what, age four, five, six, something like that. Uh, we usually kindergarten, so uh, when they start, uh, uh, public school, then we uh, usually uh, join to the Tibetan language. Okay, so yeah. I think maybe if you can start, do they do they often greet you when they come to the classroom or when they exit the rooms? Because I think if you start to get some common um, wording, vocabulary, 
Cadbury uh, welcome or, or farewells uh, that you start to use that they can say and that they can practice, um, I think that that would be really quite good. I'm not sure what the small activities that you might try beyond showing videos or, or movies or something, um, but whether you use something um, like photos and cards, if you can read books, um, and even if in, in reading those things, ask them to consider and, and to repeat back to you uh, key vocabulary. Um, the other one is that if you can put you know, images, not sure the limitations to your resources um, and the ability of how you can set up a, a classroom or learning space. But the other thing is whether you can give some visuals because if they see the visuals and they see how to sound words out, that might also be um, of assistance to, to the students as well. Okay, thank you. Okay, I think um, we're going to have to wrap it up there, uh, people. Yeah. We've gone, we've gone over time. It's been so, so interesting. The feedback's shown that um, it's very, mm -hmm. very clear. So, um, uh, I, uh, could I just thank Marie again? Marie, Marie has been uh, an integral part of this uh, of this course, and it's uh, and it's been again a, a wonderful, wonderful session. So, thanks to to, to Marie, and thanks to, to to Marie's team and all the all the lecturers from uh, Western Sydney University. Um, so could I just, just say just one last thing before we actually log off, for those of you that are interested in receiving, we do, we, we're preparing a, um, a certificate of attendance for the course, and that's why we need your attendance sheet that's on the Google uh, form that I've, that I've, I've sent the links uh, many times. Otherwise, just email me, okay, if, uh, if you can't see it all. But apart from that, everybody, the video will be there. Uh, online, you've got the YouTube link, um, and that's about it for the short course. Thank you so, so much, Marie. Yep. You did excellent work. Thank you so much. Alexa, good question. Okay, thank you. Where? Okay, I'm just can, I, can I ask you a quick question, please? 